Teetering here, on the fulcrum of destiny, stands our own bemused species. The future of the universe hinges on what we do next. If we take up the sacred fire and stride forth into space as the torchbearers of life, this universe will be a borning. If we carry the green fire brand from star to star and ignite around each a conflagration of vitality, we can trigger a universal metamorphosis. Because of us, the barren dusts of a million billion worlds will coil up into the pulsing magic forms of animate matter. Because of us, landscapes of radiation-blasted waste will be miraculously transmuted. Slag will become soil. Grass will sprout. Flowers will bloom. And forests will spring up in once sterile places. Ice, hard as iron, will melt and trickle into pools where starfish, anemones, and seashells dwell. A whole frozen universe will thaw and transmogrify from howling desolation to blossoming paradise. Dust into life, the very alchemy of God. Marshall T. Savage, The Millennial Project, colonizing the galaxy in eight easy steps. Let's make the future. Welcome to Let's Make the Future, a discussion about future trends, technologies, and their implications for human society. We are coming to you from all over the world. My name is Hossein Kuhani, a tech entrepreneur from Iran, currently living in Michigan, working on biomedical devices and future cyber technology. I'm Michael Curry, an independent software developer and entrepreneur from Canada, currently based in Calgary. I'm Daniel. Valenzuela, a mathematician and social impact enthusiast currently based in Munich. Today's format, you could uh, say that today's episode is compressed, or today's episode is a short and sweet format. We're going to discuss our topic, and that'll be it. This week's future trend discussion topic, Arcologies. I wanted to throw the ball to you, Michael, to make the definitions. So today's topic is arcologies, a perennial futurist topic. Arcology is a portmanteau of architecture and ecology. It's a field of creating architectural design principles for very densely populated, ecologically low impact human habitat. The concept has been primarily popularized, and the term itself was coined by architect Paolo Soleri. It also appears extensively in science fiction. Arcologies are often portrayed in science fiction as self-contained or economically self-sufficient. And these structures have been largely hypothetical insofar as there is no arcology, even one envisioned by Soleri himself, who first conceived of the idea many decades ago. And so none of these structures have ever been completed. But Soleri posited that a completed arcology would provide provide space for a variety of residential, commercial, and agricultural facilities while minimizing individual human environmental impact. That sounds pretty awesome, guys, right? You, you guys have heard of arcologies, right? Have you guys encountered them before, the concept? Yes. Yeah, sure. I've heard of this project of Surrey, but the thing is that it's always this... Can I tell you where I first heard of Arcologies? Please. Well, I first heard of Arcologies when I was playing SimCity 2000 in the late 90s. This was one of the last things you could build in this game after you've built a whole city of industrial areas and residential areas and utilities and everything else. The last thing you can do is to construct these Arcologies, which are like they only occupy a tiny amount of land, but they're very tall and they can house just thousands upon thousands of people. And then the the final thing that happens in the game is all the arcologies launch into space. So I don't know about the launching into space part, but my mind was sort of set racing by this idea that you could house people in this self-contained thing that like even the air is self-contained and the water and everything else. So it doesn't have any impact on the surrounding environment, doesn't hurt the surrounding environment, but it provides this lovely living space for people. That's It seemed to me like that's sort of the logical endpoint of progress in technology around uh, human living space. Spaces. That sounds so, uh, super cool, the SimCity explanation or, or when you first encountered it. But just to like understand better what an arcology means, what are some examples one should keep in mind, like some elements that an arcology should have? This sounds like such a hard task. So what are some interesting examples of components of an arcology? Yeah, let me see. 
Well, as I said, there don't appear to be any complete real world examples, but you know, I quoted a lot of that description from Wikipedia already, and certain urban projects, Wikipedia says, reflect arcology principles. So some examples mentioned here include the plus 15 system in downtown Calgary, where I am right now, um, the Minneapolis Skyway system, the windscreen in Fremont, Quebec. I don't know why they're giving so many Canadian examples or examples. Close to Canada. Uh, and also the Las Vegas Strip has many arcology features to protect people from the 45 degree heat. So many major casinos are connected by tunnels, footbridges and monorails. And it's possible to travel from Mandalay Bay at the south end of the Strip to the Las Vegas Convention Center, five kilometers to the north without using streets. So in many cases, it's possible to travel between several different casinos without ever going outdoors. Now, what's missing here is that these places are not self-sustainable, though. They're not like making their own food and recycling the water and air and things like this. But they do have the element that they provide a huge living space for people and it's enclosed from the outside elements. And also, I think what about the Vegas trip, you just have a more energy efficient way of like just imagine the heat it is in Vegas I don't know if you've been there but you basically go out in the middle of the night and you just feel the heat coming up from the streets like you could fry an egg on the streets even though there's no sun shining so that's just a way to get basically like cool the temperature of where the people of the ways of where the people commute from one building to the next building. Right, yeah. So those are some real world examples of things that kind of approximate the concept of a self-sustainable living space for many people, although they lack some of the key features like self-sustainability, but they are enclosed. But in the past, certain architects have proposed a more complete sort of version of arcologies. For example, Buckminster Fuller proposed the Old Man Rivers City Project. It was a domed city with a capacity of 120 5,000 as a solution to the housing problems in East St. Louis, Illinois. And there's, I also heard many years ago of a project, it was basically like this enormous, huge, kilometer high pyramid-like structure that would be built in the Hong Kong Harbor, or maybe it was Tokyo Bay Harbor, I think it might have been Tokyo, where it would provide housing for thousands and thousands of people in a place where land prices are very, very high. So it would be built like on the ocean there. And again, provide a lot of housing for people in an ecologically uh, friendly way. So what do you guys think of this idea? Like, is it a good one to pursue? Should we be thinking that it will happen more and more in the future? Will one actually get built? So I think what I really like about the idea that it gives us as a planet, basically, the the possibility to become more sustainable step by step. So I think you can't in large cities or, or in a more global context, it's really hard to implement changes towards sustainability because you always have all this change management that goes with it and people that will, would resist changes or would resist to give up luxury in order to live in a more sustainable way. And arcologies, if they are as good as it sounds and at some point are maybe implementable, give a really like gradual or modular approach to actually have like pilot or maybe in the beginning pilots, but also where you can just city arcology by arcology get it or like found new places where people that are willing to change or that are willing to live more sustainably, maybe early adopters or whatever you want to call them, to live in such a context and hence also enable in general more sustainability, but also the research that is needed and the, by figuring out of best practices in order to live with lower echo footprint. So I think that's an extremely cool idea. Yeah, well, when you were saying all those, uh, when you talk about that, Daniel, you mentioned learning best practices and figuring out how to live in arcologies. I think about how a lot of these proposed concepts involve people living rather isolated from everyone else. And I wonder if that's maybe the thing that prevents a lot of these projects from succeeding. Because when I see these utopian ideas about arcologies, and then I look at the decades of work that have been done on these concepts, but still arcologies seem to be remarkably difficult to build in the real world, I see that people simply don't have the willpower to bring a fun functioning our college so i think the like i don't know like this societal like um how do you say isolation how you say it, might be an aspect but i also generally think it's really really a hard topic not only for us to discuss but even more to implement because it's so interdisciplinary you see sociology economy politics but also the large portion of physics chemistry and 
agriculture and all these kind of elements going into the same project. So you need good people for that. You need very diverse people, many people. And then also, if you want to tackle the, what you said, this isolation problem, you need also basically, I don't know, maybe a sales team or something that would make it more attractive for people to live there. And I think, yeah, if, well, yeah, yeah, what do you think? Well, this is why I think our ecologies are best expressed as a collection of technologies rather than, as you say, there's so many things involved. So rather than thinking of them as a, you know, perfect self-sustaining spacecraft-like expression that's totally self-sufficient, Instead, if we just focus on the archaeology ideas, then we see that so many times they've already been done in modern condominiums. You know, the idea of many people living in a multi-use, very tall building and these networks of pathways that connect people between buildings like these things have already been implemented. So if we maybe if we just promote the adoption of these individual technologies, we're bringing human living spaces into an archaeology future without actually having to build archaeology. Thinking about the isolation part, I think I want to expand a little bit on that. Archaeology seems very interesting when you just, from an engineering perspective, you think of how you can create a sustainable human construction, human society. But then when I think practically and globally, it's something that it's against the trend of the history that when you read and you see the patterns of the history of human beings, we have gone all the way from connecting the isolated societies to a global society that are interconnected more and more every day, every year. So I think the archaeology from an isolated point of view is doomed to failure because first of all, to the free market of today, that we always have availability of cheap products and services from different parts of the world so it's hard to make it efficient and reasonable to build something by yourself as a small group of people and population so transportation and always enables people to trade things globally and makes a more decentralized network of market in a global scale that we are already in it so I feel like when you want to create a self sustainable group of population you kind of want to go against the river of the history that we have been coming so far and I think the practical solutions to the future are the ones that think globally so if you want to think of sustainability you want to think of how you can make the whole planet sustainable as the whole group of human beings rather than just small groups and population what do you think about that I wonder Haas if the technologies that are coming down the pike now like 3d print and recycling of water and air purification, those sorts of things do start to make us more self-efficient, even though you're right that people are right now very integrated into a global economy and we depend on a global production chain to obtain the goods and services that we need for our daily living. You know, every day I'm using goods that probably have been passed all around the world in a huge production chain. But if I could just go downstairs in my arcology and ask for all the goods that I need for from the building's 3D printer, maybe actually it would be okay. And it would be kind of like we're all living in these high-rise spaceships that are self-contained as much as possible. Exactly. Yeah, but my brief comment on what you say is the only way you can accomplish that day that you go downstairs and you can get what you want is the day that every other human being on this planet has the same capability or most of them. Because as soon as you want to make it practical for you to go down so there's another person on the other part of the world that is able to offer you the same product or service for cheaper and send it to you. So it's like saying, why do we have manufacturing out of the United States since 20, 30 years ago? And it's all in China nowadays. Why did we not keep the jobs and keep manufacturing? But the problem is the labor cost was not reasonable anymore. So comparing with the products that were being transported globally, so then China 
offer the cheap labor. So they couldn't resist because of the global network of the market. So even huge countries are not able to keep their same self-sustainable economy as a whole country. So how can a small group of people do that? So I think the only reason is decentralization, but also unification of services and products in future. It's even a given example of 3D printers is that 3D printers are now available to anybody globally. If you wanted to make your own 3D printer and make it yourself, it would not be able to be afforded by you. So now it's affordable because it's globally made and globally chained and networked around the world. That's why it costs $2,000 and you can buy one because it's global. So no one could ever create its own 3D printer to have it at home and then be self-sustainable and isolated from the world because it would cost a fortune to make that 3D printer. So the point I'm making is that whatever you want to accomplish, go ahead and accomplish, but think that the only way it can actually practically be accomplished is that it happens globally now. Yeah, I absolutely see what you mean and I really like the historical perspective on that. And I'm on one hand with a very similar position or like I think very similarly about it as you do because of this, uh, particularly was because of the market, you would have a really like how would you connect as an arcology to the free market or how would also the market in the arcology work? I mean, it must be like a highly regulated market. And also Michael was making kind of um, already making this point. What I was also thinking about with the internet, you can kind of stay connected. So in terms of this isolation Part. And also with new technologies like 3D printing, there's still global competition going on in mean, whatever you want to achieve. So you won't buy and, uh, something in China and let it ship over here, but you will just buy the blueprints and then get it to you. And what you were saying about the 3D printer making it yourself would be not sustainable or not really realistic. That's also the question of basically like the initial cost, the fixed cost in the beginning to build an ecology will never, you know, you will always have costs. So I guess the idea of an arcology is to live until the future with being self-sustainable, but also in the beginning, you just need to have a negative impact at some point. And the question is, if you will have, should you have an net positive impact or something to come up for the fixed cost in the beginning or not? And also, um, generally these there's no reason why it should be only in the beginning these costs and yeah the question is exactly how to connect to the global market in terms of having these ecologies as research projects earlier i mean that would be an ideal thing i agree with you that it will probably long term or sustainably only work on a global context but it would be a good idea to do research on that and actually have ecologies implemented and then you would need to make decisions about connecting to the market and looking at your supply chains basically and where you import stuff and where not and how exactly you produce. Well, on being connected and not being connected, I guess you're both making the point that today it's important to be connected to the global market, that these arcologies can't just be out on their own, isolated, that no one wants to live that way. And I certainly agree that geographically, some projects like Peter Thiel and others have proposed seasteading where people like build on pontoons a new civilization out in the Pacific Ocean or something that's far from a government so that they can avoid taxes and avoid regulations. And that's had a lot of our ecology properties to it as well. But I would say that we all agree in this room, it seems that those sorts of ideas are a no go because everybody, especially, you know, people rich enough to be able to do that, want to be able to access the cultural facilities and other people and business and everything else that exist in large cities. So the only place it makes sense to build arcology-like constructions, it seems to me, is in large, dense, already densely populated areas. So certainly we all agree that geographically isolated arcologies are a no-go. But when it comes to whether arcology should be isolated from the market and manufacture their own goods, etc., I want to take exactly the opposite view from what Haas is saying when he says the only way we can get an arcology like that 
is if everyone has access to that technology. Like if everyone in the world has access to these 3D printers, that's the only way we're going to be able to do this. And I would say it's the opposite. Having the experience of living in cities where there's a great amount of inequality, where there's extremely wealthy people and extremely poor people, it seems to me like that is actually a condition that encourages the development of self-sustaining buildings when there is that much inequality because the people who are wealthy, they would like, and they currently do live in, you know, high rise condominiums that are marketed as being sort of like our colleges. Like, you know, we have a pool, we have food, we have your stores near the bottom and you can live near the top. And if these places could be marketed even to say, oh, and we also filter your water so you don't have to worry about the terrible water that all the other people in the city have to deal with. I mean, again, that would be the presence of inequality would encourage people to live in buildings that are more isolated because they want to have better things than what the average person has. Whereas in a city like, you know, I'm in Calgary right now and everyone is living a reasonable standard of living, there's very little incentive to close yourself off from what everyone else has because we're all doing pretty well. That's interesting. Not only the having something better in some sense, but also because you you were talking earlier about the pricing being such an important factor of basically buying products and goods. So I think there's always multiple, I mean, obviously, so everybody will agree that for some people, quality plays in a more important role, but also in terms of sustainability, right now you see the trend towards buying products or sustainability being an attractive feature in products. So basically in Germany, we right now, I don't know if how it is in the US and probably people in the US don't know that coconuts don't grow there. <laughs> Sorry for being so ignorant, but here there's... <laughs> This trend that people buy much more regional stuff and regional products like apples, tomatoes, potatoes and everything. And so I think there's, if you already live in our college, you probably will be more willing to pay more for stuff that was grown in the arcology, don't you think? Yeah, Haas is totally right that as long as the price of things you can just buy out there in the real world are dramatically cheaper than the potatoes and the tomatoes that are grown and sold in the arcology, then it's going to be very hard for people to justify living in the arcology, even the super rich, or perhaps only the super rich will be able to do that. But as that price differential shrinks, maybe we'll see more and more people isolating themselves in arcology. And also, Michael, I don't know if I would agree. You said we probably can all agree. I think in the short term, yes, on agreeing on not being geographically isolated. But with a view towards progress in AR and VR, doesn't it seem like really possible that basically when you want people over visiting or when you want to go on vacation or, you know, like whatever way you could want to connect to another place, you can just do it also basically through information technology channels, just as the, with the 3D printing, just like changing the channels basically because internet and information technology is getting better and better. Oh, wow. That's so true. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, that's what I was Yeah, thinking. and again, so I just wanted to add that, again, another key factor of today's world is that because of internet, information is flowing freely available to the poorest and the richest in the world all over the planet. So even the small population that are not accessible to it, they will soon be, and that would be on the first things to do on their agenda. So in a world that information is freely unregulated and being exposed to anybody, any human being that is capable of learning language and communicating with other human beings. In this kind of world, you can't regulate and create barriers for products and services. So creating a society that is self-sustainable in a corner of this planet means that the channels of energy are blocked. So the transportation and the communication and connection to the other parts has to be blocked in order to be self-sustainable. But what does sustainability mean in, in this context when we talk? For example, you talk about Las Vegas and then it's told that, yeah, but Las Vegas is not self-sustainable because probably the water comes from the dome, uh, the water comes from the mountains and 400 miles away and some products are coming from China and so on and so forth. But then we shouldn't forget, is it a bad thing or a good thing? Do we want to have sustainable cities that they don't need to communicate and 
percent. But this interreliability of the people around the world is that what maintains peace. Actually, if there is a city today that is isolated, which is which is like North Korea or some other countries in Middle East, you see that people don't want that in the world. Other countries get immediately alert in order to make those isolated countries to get connected with them again. Why? Because that isolation can turn into paranoia, and paranoia can go and utilize itself with some weapons, and then become hazardous in the global. Community, so interconnection is extremely vital, and nowadays that's why we don't see any success in isolated, self-sustainable societies and isolated and independent societies. So the future that I see, which is beautiful for human population, is a global, sustainable community that maximizes the wealth and fortune for all the life beings around them, including the animals, which is a huge project of human beings. Now that everybody is struggling, but our ecology in the context of few small cities experimenting is not something that really attracted my attention since I started yeah. learning about it. Haas, your rhetoric is fascinating because you're basically framing our ecologies as the antithesis of modern interconnectedness, whereas I'm thinking of our ecologies as sort of the inevitable conclusion of technological progress. So we have very contrasting. Views of our ecologies here and our future. So let me explain my view in that our ecologies are, as I say, a collection of technologies that seem to point towards more self-sustainability in terms of goods, but not necessarily in terms of services. So goods like food and consumer products that you might use around the house, clothing, that sort of thing. Potentially, those things could be 3D printed or grown in self-sustainable ways in water and. And other things that you use,、uh, physical goods, those things could be potentially made more self-sustainable. And I'm not suggesting that people do this for no reason, but instead that they start to adopt these technologies because they become cheaper, because they become easier, because they are perhaps in a place where there's so much inequality, and the quality of the stuff that's out there is not very good. So they feel almost compelled to use things that they've made themselves or things that are made within the ecology. So I'm saying that this is not. Not something people are doing to isolate themselves, but doing sort of because they want the best of these goods. But then, when you talk about an integrated world being the reason why we are at peace with one another, I'm hoping that because people still want to communicate with one another and exchange services, like for example, a musician or a lawyer or an accountant or any of these kinds of people, they're still going to interact with each other, whether it's by actually physically going over to the other arcology or other city. And communicating, or if it's all done, as Daniel says, through virtual or augmented reality.、Um, so there's still a lot of integration, but it's done through services instead. But I do share your fear that you know, if what's kept us at peace all this time has been economic integration, if we're exchanging these services purely for our own amusement in a post-scarcity future where no one has jobs, that does start to be a little scary. If we really don't depend on other people for our success. So I also quickly want to. Go to what Haas said. I think the stuff we were talking about, the examples in Vegas, is that our colleges, in order to save energy, and for example, it's also a lot about efficiency. And I think that was particularly why the Vegas example was interesting. And also with the water, the problem with water is also that it's part of an ecosystem where it will also flow back into. So I think it's more about like not renewable resources. But I really like the historical approach, and you're arguing again in your arguments, and in particular also with the dependency, on it, like interdependencies on each other. So basically, like breaking it down into more one direction. So as long as a country has something to offer, I think it's still like as some part of the like. Stability that peace will be maintained, and I think you were talking as if it was completely disconnected from the world. But I think there's still an ecology would have a lot to offer for other countries or other places, just in terms of research and technologies that get developed there, and also just because they're doing good. 
for the planet. And also, they're not having negative impact on anything they would care about. So the problem is just with the self-sufficiency or self-sustainability that this will be only one direction. So by definition, they would not be dependent on other places or other services. So the question is if that is enough to maintain peace. But I think that's an, still a very interesting component. Yeah, Haas has really confused me now because I, I was going into this podcast thinking for sure this is the way things are going to go. But now he's making a great point. Like Haas, you're saying that historical trends have been greater and greater economic integration. And this is a prediction that goes against that. So it does feel a little weird to predict that that this trend that's been going on for thousands of years is going to reverse. So, yeah, great point. So, uh, can we wrap it up? I just got to leave. I wish we could talk about this forever, but thanks. Yeah, thanks for blowing our mind, Austin. Appreciate it. No, thank you. Thank you. It was a pretty cool discussion. I feel like also I was going into this discussion with similar feelings as Michael. So I think it was a really cool discussion, particularly because Ha's arguments were pretty convincing just because they were taken out of history. And I always think it's an interesting thing to learn about. I must need to think harder about all this connectedness stuff. So far, the only thing was this AR and VR ideas on how to... The problem is as soon as you connect yourself with other places, you always cannot be just completely like in this isolated system where not isolated system, but you always are also dependent on other resources. That's what I want to say. Yeah, that was a prediction made of the internet in its early days too, is that it would isolate people. And yet, of course, with social media, it's actually done the opposite. So I wonder if technologies that we first think will be isolating actually end up being things that bring us even closer together in terms of our economic integration. Um, can I just say 15 seconds that one thing that is often mentioned in the same breath as arcologies is space colonies or space stations. And of course, those really need to be quite self-sustainable in order to exist. You can't have huge production chains in space, or at least the cost becomes so much higher that if you can do it on your own through 3D printing or other mechanisms, then you're going to be much better off. And so I wonder if, Haas, your argument about how peace comes from integration, if that says some very bad things about the future political world when there's a lot of people in outer space, I wonder if people will have much less incentive to get along with one another when they live in space because they'll already be necessarily quite self-sustainable. Yeah, anyway, again, I guess the space, I guess, again, we can use the same argument and see the interdependability. If the people in space still need the people in the planet Earth, if they still rely on them and vice versa, so there will be peace. But if there is at any point there is a community that thinks that they are self-sustainable, then that would always has a rise problem in the history and it's always a matter of perspective too because what is it that we need is it sustainability meaning that we just get our food and shelter and water and then we are good then we don't need anyone else we don't need other animals or other humans is this the moment that we declare independence so i don't think it is so even if you are in a space in your mars you have everything set for yourself you get all your energy from the sun are you going to be enough or you're going to get bored or you still want to listen to some comedies of comedians stand-up comedians in planet earth when you get bored if you're still a human being so it all depends how much uh, they deviate from a human experience and turn into other species but think about it even as human beings look how much we're spending on finding aliens so still even as human beings we have everything we want on this planet we are not satisfied we are still looking for more we want more species and aliens to connect with so it doesn't stop even on a species level. So I guess connectivity is something universal and cosmic and independence and isolation is doomed to failure and welcome to like black holes. Yeah. <laughs> it's also, yeah, interesting now to think about, uh, you know, two people would like, what's the commonality between two people that are not satisfied, one wanting to watch stand-up comedy and the other wanting to explore aliens in space. I wonder what kind of connection there is psychologically. But yeah, that's drifting off. Yeah, that intellectual isolation is not something people want or cultural isolation is not something people want for sure. But I wonder if that's enough to stop people from going to war. I mean, if you don't need goods or critical services from anyone else, maybe the fact that you can't access the latest situation comedies from a country will not be sufficient to stop you from antagonizing them. But uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah. 
quality. I guess that's uh, putting a lot of pressure on our TV writers. Eh? Okay. <laughs> well, thank you again. Okay, so we see. All right, well, thanks, guys. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I had a great time uh, discussing arcology. This was really fun. Yeah, we realized it's a really large topic, so we surely could, I don't know, in a couple of weeks, do another episode on arcology and try to like get our thoughts clearer on that. <laughs> So see you next time. See you next time. See you next time. Have a good day there. You too. And have a good night. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Bye bye. Okay. Okay. Talk to you later, guys. Bye. See you later. Okay. Let's make the future. Music and editing. Christian Peltonen. Featuring the voices of Michael Curry, Jose Kuhani, Daniel Valenzuela.